Hello, Franz Patrick here. How are you doing today? I wanted to um, give a quick synopsis for you on uh, the books that I'm working on. Uh, Global Outlaws by Carolyn Nordstrom. It's funny because she actually gives a quote from Joseph Stiglitz, who is the author of this book, Globalization and Its Discontents. And so what I wanted to do was read two excerpts from this book basically so that you don't have to. So just to back up a bit, the IMF, what is the IMF? It's essentially all the countries of the world, 196 countries in the world, minus, um, I believe there's seven countries that are not a part of the IMF. Cuba, North Korea, Taiwan, Vatican City, a few others. There's, there's a few, uh, Liechtenstein, like there's a few countries that are not part of the IMF. However, the IMF is essentially controlled by the United States. The United States is the only country that has veto power. The IMF works together with the World Bank and um, the uh, other global organizations uh, to dictate policy in terms of global finance. That's a, a little bit of a background for you. So uh, before... Uh, 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 basically, I want to give you two quotes so that you don't ha I have to read this. This is tedious and boring. It's it's very, very hard to get through. But finally, on page 42, he finally kind of gets down to the brass tacks. So just bear with me. And I'm just going to quick try and quickly go through. It's kind of a long quote, but it kind of gives you a feel for the IMF. The IMF, of course, claims it never dictates, but always negotiates the terms of any loan agreement with the boring country. Now, I'm just going to pause here for a second. This book also goes well with the book called Confessions of an Economic Hit Man, Confessions of an Economic Hit Man by Perkins. I don't think it's his real name. It's probably a, a pseudonym or pen name or something. But anyway, in that book, I read that a couple of years ago. He talks about <clears throat> how he goes out representing the IMF negotiating deals which essentially um, enslave the needy countries. So it's always a bad deal for the countries. But the countries are in need of money. He goes out and negotiates. So it's a good background, actually, for this book. So let me just continue. They're saying, uh, IMF says it doesn't dictate, but these are one-sided negotiations in which all the power is in the hands of the IMF, largely because many countries seeking IMF help are in desperate need of funds. Although I had seen this so clearly in Ethiopia and other developing countries with which I had been involved, it was brought home again to me during my visit to South Korea in December 1997 as the East Asia crisis was going on. So they forced these uh, Korea, South Korea, for example, when they were in difficulty, they uh, were forced to accept all these terms and conditions. In fact, the IMF even dictated to South Korea, say, okay, we'll give you this money, a couple hundred million dollars or a billion dollars, whatever it is, but you've got to follow all these conditions, sometimes as many as 100 conditions. And not only that, but if you take this money, we want you to open up your markets to these particular products from Japan so they can dictate what the country does in many different areas. And these... Um, different areas are usually influenced by special interests. Again, the IMF is um, is is very strong armed in what they do. Now, let me just switch over. I'm not going to go through the whole quote, but let me just switch over to something else that happens frequently. Um, when the IMF goes in and lends money to a country, usually what happens is that country becomes even worse off. So the country becomes screwed up. Their interest rates skyrocket, their unemployment goes up, and it basically crashes the economy. Um, how is that possible, you say? Well, again, he details that in the book. I'm not going to go into all the detail how that happens, but I want to point out one specific area that I think is important. Um, so another situation... What happens is they, they basically engage in a speculative attack uh, da, 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 against uh, Iranian, but 
Eventually, the government runs out of hard currency. There are no more dollars to sell, so the government tries to prop up its own currency. The currency plummets. The speculators are satisfied. They have been bet right. They can move back into the currency and make a nice profit. The magnitude of the returns can be enormous. So imagine this. Assume a speculator goes to a Thai bank. This is uh, this part of the book is talking about Thailand and borrows 24 billion baht, which that's the local currency, the baht, which at the original exchange rate can be converted into 1 billion US dollars, right? A week later, the exchange rate falls. Instead of there being 24 baht to the dollar, there are now 40 baht to the dollar. He takes 600 million, converting it back to baht getting 24 billion baht to repay the loan. The remaining 400 million is his profit, a tiny return, a tidy return for one week's work. Now I know that's a little bit convoluted, it's a little bit hard to follow, but let me just summarize it for you. The IMF lends money to countries. It crashes the finances of that country so that currency speculators can make huge returns by betting against the currency of that particular country. Does that make sense? So the IMF, essentially, what this gentleman is talking about is essentially acting like a loan shark. So sometimes they'll charge interest rates as high as 25% on the money. A lot of times they don't even expect to get repaid, but they make money in other ways through special interest, special terms, etc., etc., And so again, all the countries of the world contribute to the International Monetary Fund, but the IMF is controlled by the uh, United States economists who dictate the terms and conditions and use those terms and conditions for their own special interests. The financial elites, the billionaires, the hedge fund type people. That, what, how does a hedge fund work? What is easier to do as an investor? To invest in a company and hope that company succeeds. Maybe it's competing with many other com companies in its industry and you hope that that company prospers so that the, the stock goes up. So you've invested in that company, the stock goes up and you've made a profit and you share that profit with the company and you're a part owner of that company. That's the traditional mindset of a investor or a speculator or, or someone that wants a return on, on their investment. How, how does a hedge fund work? A hedge fund, uh, typically, I'm not an expert. I'm not a financial expert. I'm just telling you the, the broad idea behind it. It's easier to sell a stock on margin. They borrow money at low interest rate to sell the stock and then with the expectation of the of the um, of the stock price to go down. It's easier to destroy a country a, a company than to have the company succeed in a competitive marketplace is the idea. And transfer this way of thinking over to the IMF. The IMF lends money to a country it already knows is in financial difficulty. Maybe, oh, shoot, sorry about that. They already know the, the company is in financial difficulty. They lend money to the, to the, the country, country. The country does even worse. And they take advantage of that circumstance through other channels. Now, he describes it in tedious, boring detail, but I'm giving you the the um, the Coles Notes version so that you don't have to put yourself through the pain of having to read this. This one shows the results of that at a frontline level. It shows the misery and the destitute situations of people living in countries that are third world countries that don't have any negotiating power with the IMF and what happens with the money that gets allocated and why it doesn't reach down to the individual citizen of that country. He talks about the concept in here of trickle-down economics and why trickle-down economics doesn't work. It doesn't reach the individual. And she gives a, it's funny how these two books go together really well because she talks about it from the level of the individual 
uh, uh, individuals in the countries involved. And he talks about it from the much higher level. He was working in the White House, in the Bill Clinton administration, and then he was working directly for the IMF. And so these are good things to read to get a sort of an inner understanding of these global economics, which are not discussed. Even in fact, even Stiglitz himself has to has to pull his punches. You sort of have to read between the lines to know what he's talking about. But you can see how the greed and profit motive is guiding these organizations, the IMF and the World Bank, and how they cooperate and, and so on and so forth. So I wanted to just share those brief points with you so that you don't have to put yourself through the torture of reading these books. If you want to, I would recommend Confessions of an Economic Hitman. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a much more fun read than uh, Stiglitz is very dry. It's like listening to a, a professor that puts you to sleep. And then the other one, uh, Carolyn Nordstrom, that one is just depressing. And so I thought I'd just give a quick summary. I hope that helps. I'll do one more summary when I finish both of the books to give you an idea of what they're all about. But it does sort of help a little bit to give an idea um, because these are concepts which are never published in in the public newspapers or in the in the public discourse. We don't see how these inner workings are driven and motivated by greed and profiteering and the robber baron mentality of the the people involved. And um, it's very eye-opening and um, very sobering to, to, to see these things. So that's it for today. That's all I was going to talk about. Hope that helps. I know it's kind of boring topic, but it's interesting to, to, um, to try and dig in and, and get a little bit of a better understanding from information that is usually kept uh, in closed doors, kept in, in secret. In fact, even the IMF itself keeps most of its negotiation uh, uh, secret and, uh, and hidden from, uh, from the public. Thanks a lot for watching. God bless you. Have yourself a wonderful day. We'll talk to you later. Take care now. Bye-bye.